Okay, man, are you ready to go? I'm He's ready to go. Now, come on, now, crank this motherfucker up. here again with another episode of Deep Listens, and today it is time for another PAX East debrief. I've been to the promised land of games, I've seen the future, and I come back bearing news of the games that you will see in the coming months. Well, some of them are out already, but maybe you didn't know about them because they were indie titles. So I come back bringing the good news, and to join me in discussing PAX East is my frequent compatriot of PAX East, former host of the Deep Listens podcast, Billy Rothert. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Um, I've forgotten everything about how podcasts work, so is this thing on? It is on. People are listening. There's Are, are, they, are they listening right now? Well, th- are you talking about like when they're, when this is being played or like as we're recording? That's the real question, Gino. That's the real question. So, yes. I'll say yes. They're listening now. Sure. So, welcome back to the show. It's been a while. It has. How How's everything been going? Uh, honestly, like, 2020 has just been kind of going my way. I mean, it's been... It's been a pleasant... Um, a, a pleasant change of pace, uh, considering there is, you know, always seemed like to be one challenge after another, um, in the end of like 2018 and the start of 2019, but <clears throat> man, shit's just lining up great. Uh, my, my business is really successful. One of my most, uh, you know, successful times of my business and, uh, my master's program has begun. I have started taking the official first steps to becoming a secondary mathematics teacher. Ooh. Uh, yep. So I'm in a master's program right now to do that. I'll be getting a certification for um, uh, high school mathematics, but it comes kind of packaged in with a master's degree, which just makes things kind of a, kind of a cherry on top. That's really really good. Uh, otherwise, uh, I've lost ten pounds in 2020. Ooh. I know. I'm just like on oh, my bullshit this and year. And that's it's something great. you wanted to do, correct? This was not yes. about with the flu. Nope, nope. It wasn't like a big flu where I just like lost all my fluids and didn't eat. Nope. This was actually like I wanted to change my diet and get healthy, and so we did the damn thing. Mm. Nice. <clears throat> yeah, 2021 has been pretty good so far. And for those that don't remember, like a major um, like a major motivation for me stepping down from the show was – trying to do better at work, trying to like actually push myself towards going towards grad school. Um, and it seems like while it was difficult to step down from deep listens, um, the fruits of my labor are starting to manifest in really cool ways. So this is definitely the correct life choice, but I'm happy to do a podcast every once in a while like this. Excellent. Well, it's been a year. We have missed you dearly. However, it is great to hear that you're doing well and that your time away from the show has made you stronger. Oh, smarter. yeah. Mm-hmm. Definitely both of those two things. Dare I say handsomer? Uh, well, <laughs> we'll ask the girl that I'm currently seeing. Hey. Hey. Everything's coming up, Billy. Everything's so, coming up, Billy. Yeah. Um, without further ado, just a reminder, you can get in touch with the show at Deep Listens Pod on Twitter, deeplistens.libsyn.com. We've got our comment sections and Deep Listens Podcast at gmail.com. You can also now support the show on Patreon, patreon.com slash deeplistens. That gets you access to our Discord where you can ask us questions about things you want to see. And I actually uh, requested the Discord just any sort of games that people wanted to know about, things that were at PAX East that we would have uh, been able to cover. So Wait, I so what? I so you, to that. you mean you, you mean people actually give you monkeys money now? They do. Like, do you like dance and stuff? Like, tap sometimes, your little symbols? Sometimes I do. Man. Sometimes I do that. Sometimes we play we play <clears throat> video games with the community. Sometimes that's crazy. Yeah, I got beaten at Pokemon. We need to hmm. play Splatoon too. We got a stuff going on. You know, I never thought about making any money when I was on Deep Listens, but man, you get, huh, innovation that excites. 
Yes. And thank you to all of our patrons, all of our supporters, and all of our listeners for making this show so successful and so fun for all of the people involved in it. And thank you for helping us make it more sustainable by supporting mm-hmm. the show. So this is the part now where, like, I give a brief intro to the game we played, right? Is uh, that is that how I is don't, that how we do this? Is I that... mean, I've I have to do my obsession. I think uh, I feel like I'm feature. just so disconnected. I just don't know how this works anymore. We have a we have a new feature. <sighs> I mean, it's it's time for my obsession. I just don't belong anymore. Sorry. All right, I'll let you do your thing. So my obsession this week is on a 90s, late 90s television show that I've been watching. Uh, Billy, have you heard – do you like vampires? Uh, yeah, okay. You're okay with vampires? Well, I hate them, and I love shows where vampires get slayed. And I've been watching Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Are you familiar with said show? Yeah, actually. Yeah. So I have started watching that show, and boy, it's delightfully stupid. At least the first season so far. I'm about seven, eight episodes in, and it is just a great throw it on. There's a monster of the week. Uh, Somehow there have been multiple animal possessions or Uh giant uh animals in the first five or six episodes. Uh, There was an episode with a a marionette or a, a dummy that came to life. It's so early in to the show, it can only go up from here. You're right. I mean, actually, Buffy gets pretty damn good in some of its middle seasons. I will say, you know, all that shit with, like, the Angel spinoff, like, you kind of you, you kind of lose some of the audience there. But I'd say, like, middle of Buffy is some just real good quality teenage angst vampire drama. Yeah, I mean, man. it was ahead of its time. It was. It's got a lot of angst. It's very ridiculous. It's Riverdale mm-hmm. before Riverdale. Oh, yeah. And it's just, it's a good time. A nice, fun show. Very light. And I've been I've been watching it. I've been churning through. And I look forward to more things. I've already seen Cyber Pagans. There was a demon in the internet, but not like an actual demon. The programs that run on the internet. It was an actual demon. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. A lot of great, great characters. Xander sucks, but that's fine. He and gets he, he he gets better, but he stays very obviously like the oldest guy in the cast. Yes, he's clearly forty five years old, and everyone else <laughs> is in their early twenties. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's just the best. So, without further ado, let's talk about PAX East. So, Billy, what games did you see that you want to talk about? Uh, well, sure. So we want to talk about the show first. We can start with the show and then talk about the games. What do you mean the show? Like the entire like the thing that is thing, PAX? Like the experience. It was a weird year because this year uh, Sony was not there because of coronavirus fears. Mm-hmm. Square Enix did not send any of their Japanese developers or Japanese talent. So their booth was still run very well, but it was just a slightly different experience. They usually have some of the devs from Hobby Japan and uh, even sometimes some of their – uh, developers for panels from from their Japanese offices, but there were a few different companies that just didn't send folk because of uh, virus fears, and so I felt like this year it was sparser in terms of attendance than in previous years. I'm yeah, I would say that as far as like the big mega developers, um, I'm sure there were some people missing from the from the Nintendo you know camp, um, and people that were missing from other big name. Um, game companies or game affiliates like streaming organizations and stuff like that probably had some some missing members but I honestly didn't see that much change in the indie side of the games yeah that and was pretty much the same that was pretty much the same so so true some of some of the big big AAA names were there sorry were missing but I think everything else was there that I wanted to see yeah and I will say it seemed like the crowds were a little bit better this year not just uh, Thursday. Thursday, if you want to actually go and play games at PAX, go on Thursday if you can. I know it's hard because it's a work day, but that is the sparsest attendance. 
you can get in at a reasonable hour. Like, I think I got to the show floor at, like, 10, and they had already cleared the entire queue room. Like, I could just walk straight into the show floor without getting there super early. Uh, and that day, I think I – like, the lines almost – all of them were pretty short. I mm-hmm. was able to get into a demo. Like, they started this year giving out tickets for demos. Like, you had to make appointments for all of the big Honestly, demos. Honestly, I liked that. I did too, but in – uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the tickets were largely given away by the end of the first rush. Like once they sent in people from the queue room, you couldn't get an appointment for the rest of the day. On Thursday, I was able to get a Psychonauts 2 ticket. I think around 1 o'clock I went to the booth and I was able to get a 4.30 ticket. Uh, that would not have been the case, I don't think. Any of the not on a Saturday or Sunday. Or like not, not on a Friday or Saturday, probably not. Yeah, so I would say if you're just going there to try and play games, Thursday is oddly one of the better days. Um, but you really can't go wrong any of the days. PAX East is still well run. Um, I will say this year there were a lot more uh, sanitary wipes, a lot of Purell everywhere, a lot of people yeah. wearing face masks. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I think it was to our benefit. I didn't get sick this year that I've noticed. Well, you you know. Um, knock on wood. Yeah, knock on wood. Knock on wood. Um, so, yeah, I think PAX overall felt kind of the same to me. I didn't notice any major, like, things missing from my PAX experience. Um, one thing that I – well, actually, there, I'll, I'll take that back. There was no super giant games booth. Yeah. And that was, you know, that is a group that I really, really enjoy seeing every time that I can go to PAX and see them. <clears throat> but that's probably the only large-ish developer booth that I didn't see. I mean, uh, Super Giant certainly no Sony, but they would still have a booth Most that would be in the main, like, expo hall, um, like a full-size booth as opposed to one of the smaller indie-sized booths. Yeah, and... it. Seemed like there was a lot, a lot more indie companies and some smaller publishers like Devolver Digital. I didn't see as many mid-tier single developers like Supergiant. Right. With their own booths. But like I was going to finish that thought earlier, with the exception of Supergiant for me, like the big developers aren't really what I go there for because – Sony is going to find all the other ways to get me to learn about their products. I'm not going to have any issue finding out what Sony is cooking up. But I wouldn't have the same access to go find a cute indie board game or like a really well-made, thought-out, innovative indie video game or talk to panelists that are experts in their field and gain some new insight and perspectives that I didn't have before. Um, So – When I think about those big developers, yes, they certainly sell tickets. You know, people go to PAX to see what Sony and Nintendo and Square are up to. Um, But I'm there because I want to see the kind of like grassroots side of of games. And I think what those people have to offer, like those mega developers, are probably contributed to like 10% or less of my PAX experience. So I was largely unaffected. Yeah, they mostly just make it hard to walk around for me. I'm not necessarily trying to go to their booths. I'm trying to get around their booths, and people tend to congregate there. Yeah, they do. So uh, what did you think in terms of the actual, like, spectacle of the show this year? Because I thought I saw some of the best booths that I've seen at a PAX. Like, the Nintendo booth this year, I think, blew it out of the park. Absolutely. Um, They had a great Animal Crossing theme, if you want to talk about that. Yeah, it so most of the you know larger booths on the show floor tend to just have rigs with games running that you can demo. Sometimes they'll set up some sort of large thing like Baldur's Gate this year had a gigantic gate with I, I assume it's Baldur's Gate uh and like a mind flayer and stuff like that that kind of encompassed the entire booth, but Usually, you're just looking at some walls to divide stuff up. Maybe there'll be a stage. Maybe you'll have a large, stupid statue of some kind. This year, at the Nintendo booth, they cre- they recreated Animal Crossing in yeah. life-size terms uh, yep. for photo ops, basically. So half of their booth was uh, demo kiosks, mostly playing 
Animal Crossing. Uh, what is the what is the name of the new game? Uh, n- it's not New Leaf. New Horizons. New. Uh, you see, yeah, something Horizons. Yeah. yeah, it's Animal Crossing New Horizons. So they recreated New Horizons like life size. So they had like giant Animal Crossing trees that you could walk up to. They had a fishing rod and a butterfly net and an axe that you could play around with. Um, they managed to have like water features and some topography and the water features were not actual water, but, uh, on the floor, they kind of had a painted mat that kind of made the layout of a animal crossing map. And they had projectors that projected onto the water features to make it look like it was running water, which looked really sharp. And then there was a large animal crossing house and they rotated a cast of animal crossing characters in front of that house that you could take pictures with. Uh, so perhaps you've heard of Thomas Nook. Ah, uh, yes. Um, in some circles, he's known as Don Tom. Or Isabel. I don't know what Isabel is also known as. I think Isabel is just Isabel. And uh, K.K. Slider. You could take pictures uh, of any of them. Yes. Yes, or yes, K-K-Slider. yes. K.K. Slider. Mix, mix Master K.K. Exactly. So that was one of the coolest booths, like going in there, uh, getting to play around in this giant Animal Crossing town. Um, it was striking, and I, it was nice to see a company use the booth space in an innovative way because the lines to get in to play demos were fairly long, but the line to get in and take pictures with Tom Nook, surprisingly short. So without further ado, Billy, are there any, were there any games you played that jumped out? Uh, yeah, so um, <clears throat> I'll talk about one that caught my eye. Um, this uh, this game is actually part of the um, part of the Kit Fox games. Uh, there was a game called Lucifer Within Us. Uh oh. Um, <laughs> I actually don't know how the title itself fits in with the gameplay, but the gameplay seemed very interesting to me. So Lucifer Within Us is set in some sort of um, theocratic future where there's a technology that allows you to interrogate somebody by reliving, or not not necessarily reliving, but um, you get to see the world as they saw it in 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 their testimony. And so you can look for discrepancies in what they've said versus other people have said, but it's all in a continuous timeline. So, for example, um, witness A says that at 12 o'clock I went to the store, and then at 1 o'clock I had a phone call with my mom, and then at 2 o'clock I ate dinner or, like, I ate lunch with a friend. And um, witness B could say things as well, but you'll notice that they don't line up perfectly on the timeline So, um, with, what, with what witness A said. So somebody's lying, find the discrepancies. Um, I didn't actually get my hands on this game, but I watched about 30 minutes of people playing it, saw some of the dialogue. Uh, it seemed to be well-written. It seemed to have a tight UI about how you can examine the different uh, pieces of the timeline as all these people were um, were being interrogated. And I think the whole game is wrapped around one specific murder case. So it's not going to be scattered as far as its narrative is concerned, but really a, a, a good old-fashioned whodunit, but set in the future where the church runs everything. And I'm guessing if you are convicted of murdering someone, the, 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 the church would have some things to say about it somewhere along, along the lines of damnation and like eternal you know, suffering and stuff like that. They'd find the Lucifer within you. Something, yeah, you know, may, may, maybe, may, maybe, maybe. So, and, oh yeah, actually, I think they call like the chamber where you get interrogated, like the exorcism chamber or something. Great, it's something really just overt and dramatic, fitting for um, you know a theocratic environment. So you said that this game takes place like you are watching timelines play out in real time. So yeah, what mm-hmm. is the visual setup? Is it a first person game? Is it? Um, It's not first person. It's like somewhat isometric in nature, but I don't think it fit like isometric the way that I know it. Like the best example of isometric games that I can think of are like Final Fantasy Tactics and like Bastion from that specific angle. Um, I think it had similar, similar angles, but honestly, my memory is escaping me. It's either that or it's more of a, just a traditional top down, but with, 
um, more detailed visuals than you than you would expect for like a sprite. Okay, so there are, are you just like a disembodied camera watching these events take place in front of you? No, with some it's narration? in it, no, it's in it, it's in third person. So you're controlling a protagonist. Okay. And you will walk around and interact with people. And it's sort of like, like I, I think I want to almost liken this game to Remember Me, mixed okay. with maybe like some Assassin's Creed with the whole, um, what do they call it? Not the, not Cerebro, but uh, Ubs, <laughs> Abstergo or something? Abstergo, that's the evil company. Yeah, but what's like the machine that they use? I forget what it's called. Uh, the Animus? Yeah, the Animus. It's like Animus mixed with um like remember me because you're like going into a person's memories but they could be wrong and they could be modified all that stuff so mixed with phoenix right mixed with phoenix right yeah mhm 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 very cool uh so the first game that i'm going to talk about is the one that i think everyone would expect i saw psychonauts 2 absolutely um this was uh before i took requests i immediately went to uh see psychonauts 2 and that game Sure is Psychonauts. Uh, I did not get to play it. They had a uh, theater, basically, where you could go in and watch someone play the demo. And it seemed to be the first level. And recurring characters, totally there. All the same voice talent. And the story picks up right from uh, the Rhombus of Ruin, the VR game that came out, I think, a year or two ago. So it picks up right from the end of the Rhombus Ru- Enter the Rhombus Ruin, and seems like Psychonauts. I'm going to play it a lot. I didn't notice any gigantic differences. It looked like they took away um, the Psy energy that you need to use to do Psy Blasts, and now it's just on a cooldown. But other than that, everything seemed to play very similarly. And they seem to also start you with the Psy powers that you had from the first game instead of having you re-earn the badges. So hopefully... You'll end up playing, they'll expound on your tool set instead of forcing you to do the God of War thing where you have all your powers and then they strip you of all of them and you have to earn them all again. That's never fun. I mean, I see how it's a a model to be like a teaser, but I I think it kind of worked back in Metroidvania style games and stuff so that you could learn that there is going to be a progression in what you're looking for. But I think we've seen that now and I don't like it. So I am also hoping that we just kind of get access to all those things, but the game changes around us so that it's not as obvious how to use them anymore. Yeah. Or they give us new powers that are necessary and those are the things that gate you, but yeah. the old powers are your default tool set. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So Billy, any other games here? you were interested in well yeah uh there's one from um it's actually a sequel to a game that we played on the podcast uh is this sometimes always monsters this is sometimes always monsters i got screwed up when i went to see that game first i saw it i read it and my brain went sometimes always sometimes monsters wow uh i guess maybe they're releasing on switch or something and I talked to one of the developers, and they're like, yeah, this is the sequel to Always Sometimes Monsters. I'm like, isn't it? The, isn't the name the same thing? No, this is Sometimes Always Monsters. Yeah, you fool. Damn it. Yeah, you goon. Yeah, I saw this game too, so what did you like? <laughs> what did you think of it? Well, the first thing that I asked before I learned anything about this game's plot, I talked to both the devs, and I said, is there a scene – where we can just hear endless dialogue between you two again, like we did in Always Sometimes Monsters. And they confirmed, yes, that there is another interaction where you can talk to manifestations of the developers in their own game, talking with one another, and you eavesdrop on their conversation as they just kind of muse about life for lines and lines and lines and lines and lines of dialogue. <laughs> that is That is great. Then we learned that this game is not only a direct sequel, but can play off of your original save file. I don't know much about how this works. I might need you to help me, but apparently if you have a save file of Always Sometimes Monsters, you can like port it into Sometimes Always Monsters and it will carry over information. Yes, I think it will ca- it'll carry over your character because remember you can select between several different characters at the beginning of that game. 
Um, and I believe your love interest is somewhat uh, very – I forget if it's the love interest or just some of your decisions will carry over. So you at least get some experience, experience some sort of consistency there. Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm, the mm-hmm. main character in Always Sometimes Monsters is a author, and the key to that game was just a build-up, like – you were broke, you were down on your luck, you were tr- basically burning out a book advance and you hadn't finished your book, and you were just trying to get across the country to go to your ex's wedding, and you wanted to kind of break it up because you missed them. And the progression of that game was um, working in a town, getting enough money to afford a bus pass, then you could take the bus to the next town and you'd earn more money move on and the progression in sometimes always monsters is the opposite you are starting off as a successful author and you are now on the downslide you start with an abundance of money and then can lose it can spend it can hoard it if you want to and it's more of a instead of asking what would you do to find someone that you want to be with and uh, how do you balance your own needs with helping others? This is saying when you have abundance, when you can take care of seemingly everyone, d- will you or will you be selfish and only take care of yourself? Right. So that was a that was a fun one. Um, I saw a lot of stuff going on at the Devolver uh, booth, but I didn't actually get my hands on any of those games. There was actually a pretty long line for Devolver when I went. Uh, when I went in there, but apparently, um, uh, Gungeon is still running, running strong. Um, and we're still, we're still waiting on Eider. Um, that's a game that I've been watching for a long time and it's been on my Steam wishlist for a long time, but it seems to be just kind of stuck in development. I don't know much about it. Yeah, I, I didn't see too much of the Devol- Devolver booth because, they have a lot of pixel arty action games, and I've played so many. I just yeah. wanted to check out other things. Though I think, if I remember correctly, um, Windjammers 2 is a Devolver. I think that's a Devolver uh, game. Yeah. Day Dalek, maybe? Well, I played it's Windjammers 2. That game's really good. D. Um, oh, no, that's... Uh, Dot emu, dot hmm. do do temu or something. Okay, well I played yeah. I played uh, Windjammers two and that game's good. That game's still yeah. good. Yeah, well Win Windjammers two like Windjammers one I thought was like kind of a sleeper hit. Like I wasn't expecting that game to I guess be popular, but it was. I mean, I it... looked at it and I thought it was kind of simple, but like. Hell, I mean, it did its thing. Giant Giant Bomb is almost single-handedly responsible for Windjammers getting remastered and for Windjammers 2's existence. They they played Windjammers 1 on stream so many times and kept asking people if someone would remaster Windjammers, mm-hmm. which was a fairly obscure, I believe, Neo Geo game. So, you know, over 20 years old. And eventually they tricked someone into actually doing it. Yeah. I and guess now that's we've how got it goes. Windjammers 2, which is pretty damn good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They added more characters. There's more variants in the characters. They added uh, some additional moves that you can do when you're throwing your frisbee. Um, so one of the big themes that I saw, uh, one of the requests that I got from the Discord was to play as much weird co-op shit as I could. And so I noticed in doing that that there were a bunch of games that are overcooked butt is how i would describe them yeah um there was one game i think it was called moving out this they somehow got the billy joel license uh and it is about overcooked but your movers so you're picking up uh sofas and stuff and you need two people to pick up sofas because they're heavy uh or you need one person to pick up certain items but you're all running around this house trying to clear it out as fast as possible and hijinks ensue um i played a game called out of space which was a overcooked but space. Yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh. So 
there's up to four players running around a space station. You need to use, like, a broom or a mop to clean up space goo. You need to take down aliens uh, because they've overrun parts of the ship. But you need to, like, earn money and buy batteries to power the parts of your ship. And then you're kind of juggling your characters. Each, ha- you know, can only do one thing at a time. So you need to cooperate. You know, one person's going to open the door. One person's going to walk through the door and clean. Mm-hmm. Um and you also need to juggle, like, some sleeping and eating so that your characters don't just uh, fall down. Perish. It's not being useful. Uh, so that game had some procedurally generated levels, but it's mas- mostly just designed for couch co-op. Um, but one interesting fact about the game was that it's uh, developed by a Brazilian company. So the entire dev team flew out from Brazil to show the game off. Cool. Tight. So that was pretty cool. Um, the game played well. I think of the overcooked likes that I saw, that was probably that and uh, moving out were the two that, that were the most polished. I also played Tidying Up, which – or Tidy Up, which is overcooked, but your contractors. So, like, you're laying down carpet and painting walls and cleaning up goo and stuff like that. And – uh that game was fine. Um, it seemed a little bit less varied than the other than the other ones. Um, it didn't do as much with the formula. It seemed much more like overcooked, but perhaps less depth. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Do you see anything cool in uh, multiplayer? Um, I actually like. I I know that I saw a lot of games, but. None of them really stuck into my mind. It was sort of a look through the indie booth and be like, huh, that game seems cool. But they didn't stick into my mind very much. Like, I spent a lot more time in panels and in tabletop this year. And so I really, really enjoyed the games that I saw. Those were the ones that I was probably the most excited about was... Um, seeing new stuff out of Kit Fox games. Um, loved seeing that Boyfriend Dungeon is um, so well on its way. Um, Dang, I, I was looking for Boyfriend Dungeon. I saw a Boyfriend Dungeon standee, but I did not find Kit Fox games. Yeah, but... I found Kit Fox. Um, they were the ones that did Lucifer Within Us. And Boyfriend Dungeon is still coming along strong. Um, Sometimes Always Monsters was one that I stopped and talked to them about. Obviously Psychonauts 2... Uh, there were definitely some games that caught my attention. I was actually really looking through my notes, and I could not find the name of this game or the developer's name. And I, I, I could have swore I had it in like one of my business cards. So if I find it, I'll, I'll jump back up. But and this is not the best podcast content. But there's, there's no a problem. game. <laughs> I, I've there's got a... a game that looked to me like XCOM, but. It was much more about like building relationships with the with your squad mates as you go. It seemed to have a lot more like relationship development. So it's Fire Emblem. Uh, yeah, I guess, but like it it didn't play play like a tactics game. It played like XCOM. Definitely run, mm-hmm. duck for cover, resource management, as opposed to level up, grinding, party composition, magic, swords, and that kind of stuff. I always found XCOM and Fire Emblem to be of a piece that and, and final fantasy tactics like those isometric strategy games. But I, if there's more relationship building between the characters, always good. And if you can find what the name of the game is, we can talk about it. Yeah. Um, I'll dig into it. And if I find out later, you can just tweet about it or something. I don't know. So a couch co-op game, or this is actually a couch competitive game that I saw that really stood out to me was, it's called uh, No Time to Relax. It's available right now on Switch. And the game is a competitive life simulator. So basically you start the game, each of up to four players starts with a, f- a couple hundred dollars in the bank. And the way that the game works is you are moving, you have a week, the game plays out in weeks, like each turn is a week. And you have to decide how you want to spend your time. Um, and you are, you know, going to get an education, you're working at a job, you could go to the gym, you need to eat, you need to take care of your, your character, and depending on how you spend your time, uh, you will increase your money, happiness, education, and physical fitness, and those four stats basically govern your end score. So the goal is to maximize each of those as much as you can, 
before the end of the game. Um, but the one f- resource that is completely infungible, it's the resource that matters, is time. So traveling from your apartment to someplace costs you time. Uh, being in that place and doing stuff, so like if you're buying, if you're working out at the gym, uh, that workout time will cost you time. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. If you go to school, you're going to lose time when you're in school. Uh, you can spend time on working, and that will turn time into money. So you're juggling all these different things, and you also need to take care of your character. So like if you don't eat, you'll lose a large chunk of your time your next turn because you're hungry. Uh, if you don't pay your rent, you will have a levy placed on all your future earnings until you pay your rent off. So if you pay your rent off on time, uh, there's no interest. But if you don't, you just have this lien on all of your future earnings until you pay off your rent with interest. Hmm. Um, And then there are a bunch of different ways that you can kind of juggle how you're going to spend your time. Like you can uh, get more educated, which will allow you to unlock higher levels of employment. Uh, but you might not be able to do the higher levels of employment yet because you need experience. So they won't hire you for the better jobs even if you have the education because you need to put in 100 hours first working someplace doing uh, the shitty jobs. But then once you do the shitty jobs for long enough, you can then work your way up, and then you start having some dichotomies between the different places you can work. Like all the starting jobs, all the clerk jobs, I think paid the same amount. But if you work at the fast food company – you have very little earnings potential. Uh, you can't get that paid no matter how educated you are or how skilled you are. Right. But some of the other places that you can get jobs, they'll pay you better. Uh, you will have to work fewer hours to get more money. So mm-hmm. it's it's a lot of juggling. But um, it was interesting because the, the way that you would want to play the game kind of changed depending on how many hours, how many turns you were playing. So like if you were playing a short game, Doing things like buying a fridge doesn't make a ton of sense because fridges are super expensive, and that's a huge outlay of money, which means that you're probably not going to be buying a lot of groceries because your groceries will spoil without a fridge. So you're spending a lot of time at the fa- at the fast food place, um, so working there might be more efficient because then you're – you know, you have to go there to get your food. Um, but then in like medium or long games, you want to buy things like fridges so that you're spending less money on food because the groceries are cheaper than the fast food. And the fast food also makes you unhappy and hurts your health, your health. Um, or you might want to invest in a bus pass or a car, which will allow you to move around quicker. Uh, you can also like upgrade your apartment so that you've got nicer accommodations. The rent is higher, but you will get more happiness when you're in your apartment if it's nicer. Mm -hmm. So there's all these little trade-offs and uh, little ways you can juggle. And it was a pretty quick game. Like you could play a short game in like a half hour, 40 minutes. And it seemed like a a nice, interesting take on almost like a – I wouldn't say that it's quite Mario Party because there's no mini mini games. But it it felt like a little board game. Right. Um, I actually did f- – no, I, di- I, di- I, di- I didn't find that specific game that I was talking about before, um, but I found two other games that stood out to me, and one of them is actually very similar. It was called Other Side. Um, that uh, that was another one that is similar in that XCOM um, vein, but it's very, like, dark and kind of horror-based. Um, I, again, I got to watch gameplay of it but not um, get my hands on the controller itself. It looked really, really cool. That was just a quick one, but one that stood out to me that seemed more interesting, although I think that that other side game sounds really fun. I think I would, I think I'd like to play another well-made um, game similar to that sort of turn-based strategy game. But there was a game called Spirit Fairer that I saw, and Spirit Fairer was by a company called Thunder Lotus Games, which is a great name, um, super great name. Way into that name, yeah. So Thunder Lotus Games. Uh, is working on or has released Spiritfarer. Um, you play as a character named Stella, and you're kind of like operating the boat on the River Styx, sort of. So you you travel from these islands, like around these islands, and you have to like make friends with the spirits of the dead, um, and you have to do like quests and stuff to make them like you or friends with you, so... Um, it had really, really sick artwork, like lots of cool um, use of 
of color and I guess the correct word for this is like shades and hues. They would like pick a color motif and then it'd be not monochromatic, but like similar to that. It'd be very um, theme based and I'm a sucker for some good aesthetic work. Um, so that, that game seemed like it had some interesting stuff going on as far as its art style and some of its gameplay mechanics, um, like becoming friends with spirits as you ship them across to the underworld. Is it a lighthearted take? Are we talking Beetlejuice here, or are we talking? Uh, no, like yeah, it seems like it's pretty. It seems like it seems like it was pretty upbeat. Um, it seems storybooky. That's how I would describe it. Um, but again, that doesn't actually take it away from dark. It's not Beetlejuice. I'll just it's say not that Beetlejuice. Maybe it's Grim Fandango. No, because it's not. It's it's not even dark, like skeletony. It's more. It's it. From what I saw, it seemed. It just seemed more like artful and beautiful. Like not everybody's take on the afterlife is black or bleak. You know, it's it's it was more. I don't know. How does it compare with flipping death? Oh, fuck. That Remember game. that game? I'm I <laughs> successfully forgot that game. No, <laughs> no. F- fl- flipping death was cool, but it was cool because of its ridiculousness. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to remind you that Flipping Death exists. I had forgotten about Flipping Death. I I didn't I didn't hate Flipping Death, but I I packed that away into the into the box of weird Deep Listens podcast games that I had to play that I won't interact with ever again. Well, speaking of weird games, though these maybe you will want to interact with in the future. I played uh, some games from the Sock Pop Collective, so S O K P O P Collective. Um, they are a game developer collective that is Patreon funded, and you can also buy their games one off. But they basically allow you to subscribe to a service that every two every two weeks they release a new game, and the games vary in length and genre and style. Uh, the game I played was like slap; it was like hockey, but with animals. So it was two on two, two on two hockey, uh, and the different animals had different hockey sticks and different lengths and different properties, and that that was fun. It was just a good time. Like I used a duck at one point, and the duck was the fastest and also could kind of dribble with the puck. You could just keep the puck connected to your stick. Then I tried playing as a snail, and the snail had a longer hockey stick, but was super slow, but was more powerful swinging. You could be a uh, snake and the snake could hit the puck with its tail and with the and with the hockey stick, so that was a, a fun little goofy thing. But it seemed like they had single player games, they had other couch co op games, a lot of little games, um, but all of them seemed well made and, and interesting. So if you want some value potentially, like a lot of games, all for a relatively modest price, maybe check that out. Now, for single-player things that I saw, um, the one that jumped out to me the most and the game that I'm definitely going to be checking out as soon as it comes out is Floppy Nights. I don't know if you saw that game. No. So it is kind of a deck-based strategy game. So think like a grid-based tactics game, like a Final Fantasy Tactics uh, except it's uh, completely, it's not isometric, it's completely 2D. Uh, so it's just a grid laid out with uh, some terrain and stuff. Um, but all of the units that you make are cards in a deck that you have. So you draw a hand at the beginning of every turn. You start every battle with one unit placed by default, and you get to decide where it's going to be placed. There's kind of a a zone where you can place your units, like in XCOM. And then from there, you're drawing from your deck, uh, and the car- you have a set pool of energy that you can expend every turn, uh, but you can use that energy to play any number of different cards. So, like, there are cards that allow your units to move, there are cards that allow your units to attack, there are cards that place new units on the board, and then when you place units, the units will not only, you know, have attack and defense stats and movement stats, but some of them will also generate cards that will go directly into your hand or directly into your deck. So you want to roll out units not just to increase your combat efficacy, but also to gain access to their special cards that make uh, your 
your squad more powerful. Like there was a cactus unit that I deployed that had four health, two attack, but when you played it, it had a thorn card that allowed one of your units to be upgraded to gain a counterattack and gain an additional point of damage. So it showed some interesting promise, I think, because if you've played, like, Slay the Spire, um, and that's a game we recently checked out for the podcast, uh, I, I really like deck-building games, and this seemed to blend two genres that I really enjoy both. You know, I really enjoy tactics games, I really enjoy deck-building, and putting both of those things, you've put some peanut butter in my chocolate, and it also looks really great. Like, I believe the art is done by the same artist who did Dicey Dungeons, so it's really cute. It's got that mm-hmm. like modern day Cartoon Network or, or Double Fine sort of art style, and everything really popped. The story seemed fun and cute. Uh, your main character has a mechanical. It, it's called Floppy Knights because your main character has a robot arm with a little robot in it, and you slap a, a slap a floppy disk into it at the start of every battle. Dope. Um, so yeah, I, they had a 2020 release date, but no definitive day or month even but i'm gonna keep my eyes open for it i I signed up for the email list because i want to know when that thing comes out um but that was definitely the game that i that spoke to me the most i don't know if it will be the best game but that is the game that is right up my alley nice nice um another game i looked at was cyberhook it was a first person runner uh where you had a grappling hook so it's a speed running game where you're running through these kind of 80s, almost like Tron sort of environments, uh, running through as fast as you can and using a grappling hook to swing and jump over large expanses. And it's basically just a series of levels that you are running through as fast as you possibly can. And the controls felt really fluid. I thought that the grappling hook mechanics felt pretty good. Um, it. The only issue I had was that because it's first person... There were some times where if you grapple too close, you just have a screen full of platform and you get completely disoriented. But that's going to be a game that I think will be really skill testing and seeing high level, high skill runs will be interesting. Um, So it seemed like a fun game if you are into Twitch. It's not really a shooter, but it's kind of a shooter because, you know, the grappling hook shoots out. Um, You might enjoy that game. Um, and let me see, were there any other, uh, one other cool game that I saw, it was an indie game, was, uh, Raji. It was kind of a god of war, but using Hindu and Indian iconography instead of ancient Greek. Uh, it seemed to be an action-adventure game similar to god of war. You were jumping around, you are fighting large monsters, uh, you get multiple weapons, the weapons have different properties, uh, you're talking to gods, you're fighting ancient monsters, but uh, I spoke with one of the developers, and I believe they're based out of... They're definitely based out of India. I think they're based out of Pune. Um, and they mentioned that, you know, they played a ton of games, but in India there are not very many games that are based and set in India. So they wanted to kind of fill that that gap. And the graphics were completely gorgeous. Uh, the cutscenes were really nice. And some of the cutscenes even had, like, I would say, like, paper puppets. Like, some puppet theater sort of stuff that was really striking and looked good. So, I, I would say check check that out. It's coming out soon on Xbox One. So, I think that's it for the games that I want to shout out. Um, did you see anything VR? I did not see anything VR-related. Um, but... Um... I know that there was a lot of VR around. I remember seeing a lot of um, people doing stupid stuff in curtained off and padded areas. Um, So I just assumed they were on VR. Um, And so that was interesting because I like watching people with headsets in like a very um, inert and sterile environment doing something that they think is really cool, but they look stupid on the outside. Yeah, I I definitely I played two VR games. I played one where I was a VR quarterback, and I threw some tight spirals. Um, but that was a little disorienting because I don't know if you've ever played a VR game where you your character moves but you are not moving physically. But it made it made me feel not great in my stomach. 
Um, so that I, I could only play that for a little bit. But I played a game called Area Man Lives that was pretty fun. It was a pretty unique concept. The conceit was you are a radio DJ in a, you know, kind of boondock sort of place. Like you're kind of out in the sticks and you're, you know, just doing your normal radio show. And you have a listener who thinks that you're talking to him through the radio, like him specifically, and thinks that the things that you are doing on the radio station is sending him commands and and signals uh, for what he should do in real life. And he keeps getting himself killed by following your commands. So there are about a hundred ways for him to die by taking your instructions as you're putting on your radio show and only one way for him to live. So the game is to try to figure out what the correct combination of things to do is to get this man to not get himself killed. Um, But you're interacting with the game. You're just in a radio studio. So you're like playing different records. Um, You're reading out news when news comes in. You're trying to put on your show, but you're also trying to make sure this guy doesn't get himself murdered. And in my version of the game, I, uh, I was not able to save him. He broke a car window with a hammer and then got run over in retribution. Tight, but it, tight. It's kind of run-based. Like, you're going to keep replaying the game, <clears throat> fiddling around with this tool set, and trying to get this guy to save himself. Well, uh, I actually did find the name of that game that I mentioned earlier and the dev company. Um, I was cool. digging through... Um, like the business cards and like the flyers and stuff because when you're walking around packs, people just kind of hand you flyers and stuff. Um, yes, but, they do. Yeah. So it's, that it's not quite Times Square people trying to give you their rap albums. No, 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 not quite. But it's close. Mm-hmm. So, so this game the the game was called Element Space, uh, developed by Blowfish Studios. Uh, And the reason why I found them is because of another game that I saw that also caught my attention that was called Kung Fu Kickball. Uh, Kung Fu Kickball is described, I'm just like reading off their pamphlet, uh, described as a team-based fighting sports game where the best ball kicker wins. Punch, kick, and headbutt your way across the field to slam the ball into your opponent's bell and rack up points. Um, Look, this game may or may not be good, but I just love the fact that there's a kung fu sports game because let me just say Shaolin Soccer was a great movie and anything that's even adjacently close to that has my attention. Excellent. Um I did find one last uh game uh flyer that maybe that one that I wanted to talk about and this is my last one cuz I went through my whole stack. It was a game called Panzer Paladin. Ooh, Panzer Paladin. Um, I also got to watch but not play, but it seems to be a um, oh yeah, sort I of saw like this an, game. Yeah, it was like an action. Pl- like it, was, it was like an action platformer where you are in a battle suit, uh, and you're supposed to be fighting all these weapons and like demons and stuff. But um, you take weapons from enemies as you kill them. You yep. then beat them over the head with their own weapons. If you want to cast magical spells, you break the weapons, and so you have to get a new one. And so it yeah. seemed like a kind of action-y, platform-y game where you're sort of encouraged to not just like go a build or go a route because you're going to limit yourself by not having all, access to all your abilities if you don't destroy your gear and have to re and have to re-equip stuff. Yeah, it looked like a Mega Man game or like a Castlevania, like that style, but it also seemed to have some light, I wouldn't say RPG, but some light inventory mechanics because you're stashing all of these weapons that you're murdering dudes for, and then you're expending them to do specialized attacks. Uh, It it looked cool. It looked like an NES game, but, um, you know, obviously graphics upgrade, musical upgrade. There was a surprisingly large presence for it. I had never heard of it before. Yeah, and you know what really caught my attention was the pamphlet. Did you take one? I did not take one of their pamphlets. The last time I took a pamphlet, I ended up in – we're not going to talk about it. Okay. I'm in real time 
texting you right now a picture of this pamphlet and tell me if you think this says anything about Panzer Paladin. Okay, you're 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 going to think that I grabbed this pamphlet from some kind of like gag box of like horribly made um like airplane info directions style di- like direction sheet on how to like throw weapons and attack and shit. It's okay. honestly one of the dumbest things that I've seen as a um game pamphlet. So I I almost kind of want to do this live I'm where waiting for the I'm waiting for the text. I just I just texted it to you. We'll see how long it takes to load in um, real time. It, yeah, real time we're doing waiting. it. We're 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 doing it live, guys. These bits are hitting satellites. They mm-hmm. are being beamed down to my phone. Mhm. Mhm. Oh, downloading. Yeah. So I'll just say I opened up this pamphlet before I actually – okay, here's my, like, progression of how this game interested me. I said, Pan- I said Panzer Paladin, that just sounds cool. Sure, I'll take a pamphlet. I opened it up and I said, what the fuck is this game about? And then I looked at the actual game and I was like, this has nothing to do with what this pamphlet is talking about. But now I'm interested in the game itself. So that's how they caught my dumb ass. This pamphlet's incredible. Wait. <laughs> so the first, the top line, so I can't emphasize enough that these people look like an airplane instruction manual. It, like it is. Poorly drawn. Poorly drawn minimal people colors. doing stuff. Yes. But like the top one is a man with a sword cutting a guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, then the second one is a woman with a sword throwing it over a guy's head. Third one is a man with a sword putting a sword into a stone. And then the last one is a guy breaking a sword over his knee and then lightning coming down with his thumbs up. Two thumbs up, baby. And then there's there's a section that says eject. This is the best a, one. There's a pregnant woman just cradling her baby, her baby belly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then panel two is her being unzipped like a suit. And then... The third one is a tiny baby with a whip. Like an Indiana standing, Jones whip. Just just emerging out of the torso. I don't – good work, Panzer Paladin. <laughs> the game looks nothing like this. So from what we can gather, yes – They had a good marketing budget. There, <laughs> the top line, I think you never actually said it though. What did it say? I didn't. Oh, did you not see the top line? Okay. I... The top line, it says um, safety procedures during demon invasion. Mm. Step one, attack. When then, then it had all this, uh, all the, the panels that you described. So it tells you that there's attacking in this game, weapon throwing in this game, checkpoints. You, you, you cast spells by breaking weapons. And then if you eject from your mobile suit, you're, I guess, slightly less well defended like this whip. but you have a whip like this baby unzipping from this woman yeah that's upsetting great work pamphlet person <laughs> i can we can, can can we talk about tabletop or like panels or whatever now yeah, i'm so, done talking uh, about games tabletop um i played a lot of final fantasy trading card game they finally had the support that i wanted billy how many years has it been since i have been going to that booth saying man i hope they get some sort of Final Fantasy presence. Too uh, many years, do you know? It's either been too two or three many years. years. The first time I went, they actually had a large like GP on the same day as PAX East, and I didn't leave the show to go compete in a tournament that I'd get waxed in. Then last year, I was able to do Gunslingers against uh, some of the Japanese devs, and I, at that point, was okay at the game, but not very good. This year, um, I've gotten much better. And uh, on day one, I was able to beat uh, one of the pros. And funny story about that, actually. Um, Two of the people who were working the booth, I I am acquaintance. I'm friends with one of their teammates because uh, they are members of the RVA Returners. You may remember we interviewed one of their members uh, about a year ago now. Um, And... Those two team members actually played a deck that I designed at U.S. Nationals, uh, one of them taking it to top eight. And we had never met. They found my deck from an online local tournament that I was in, 
and then they tried it in their locals and just trounced people. And so they took it to nationals. It, it did pretty well. So I got a chance to actually meet them, shake hands and everything. So that was cool. Um, I beat one of them and got some promos out of it. Then on Saturday, I entered a sealed event and won that as well. So I ended up pretty okay on Final Fantasy stuff. And then I, uh, to complete a play set of a promo that I wanted, I played again and lost. So I lost one match on the weekend or one game on the weekend, but all in all, a successful weekend, got to meet people, and they were running multiple tournaments. It was so great to see. Um, they had multiple pre-release style tournaments where they were giving out pre-release packs and having people do sealed decks. Um, they had tournaments where you could use any of the pre-constructed decks that they were selling at the booth. So you could use any starter deck, and then they were just playing tournaments with starters, no modifications of any kind. Um, they still didn't have any tournaments for people with their own constructed decks, but it was great to see just some competitive play outside of gunslingers and outside of teaching people how to play. So that was a big, that was big for me. That was fun. Um, I spent a lot of time at that booth uh, playing and, and helping uh, people learn how to play the game. Yeah, yeah. And then both of us had a good time at the Late Waste Games booth, who people who listen to the show might be familiar with because they've supported the Giant Bomb Community Endurance Run mm -hmm. now like four years in a row. Uh, we've raffled off copies of Dragoon and Human Era, uh, two of their games. And we checked out their new game. Life Siphon. Life Siphon. Mm -hmm. So Life Siphon, um, I knew right from the beginning when I played Life Siphon last year at PAX that Gino was going to love this game. Gino if, loves this game. If there is one thing that I know about Gino, it's that he is ready to pay life as a resource. Gino loves when life is your resource, when you have one resource and you can spend a lot of it to make other resources. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Life Siphon, it's pretty hard to describe what type of game it is, but it's sort of like a little arena brawler in in board game mode that loosely follows combat rules like Magic the Gathering. Yes. Um, I, I say loosely, and we'll get into that for um, a little bit. Um, but essentially, it's a it's it's in the same universe as Dragoon, their first game. Uh, humans have fled and gone underground. They have because uh, there are dragons, right? Because there's dragons above, and, and the dragons are just owning people, um, literally and figuratively. So the humans flee underground. And they come across some kind of uh, you know, demon or sort of dark entity who says, hey, you know, I will uh, grant you guys the power to battle and fight off these dragons. The only thing is you got to kill one of your friends. And you can play this game with up to two to four players. And the person to your, to, to your left, that's your mark. You need to kill them. The way you win the game is by bringing the player to your left to zero hit points. Everyone else loses the game. And that means the person that you're not aggro against loses if you kill the player to your left, which means kind of like everybody else on the board wants them to not die. Yep. You are basically trying to keep everyone else alive except the person to your left. Yes. Though the person to your right is actively trying to kill you. But you also kind of have to keep them alive because if the person yeah. sitting across from you kills them because that's the player to their left, then you also lose? Yes. So there's an intense tension between each of the players to try and keep everyone except the person they're trying to kill alive, but also make progressive, like make aggressive moves to actually win the game. So you're expending resources, and the resources in this game, your main resource is life. Uh, you start with 20 life. And you can spend that life to create, to summon units. There are three different unit types. There's a Lich, a, an Imp, and a Dread Knight. Um, the three unit types, one of them is kind of a uh, middling combat unit. It's pretty inexpensive to create. And it when it dies, it gives you some health back. Um, one of them that's the imp. is... That's the Imp. The Lich is the same combat stats as an imp but the lich can attack can only be blocked by liches and it can also snipe other units so instead of attacking the opponent it can attack the unit specifically 
And Dread Knights are kind of your big bruisers. They are the cheapest to create, but they cost life to move. So uh, Dread Knights hit super duper hard, and they're the only unit that will be able to beat the other unit types in combat straight up. Dread Knights trade with Dread Knights, but they beat the other unit straight up. So you kind of have this strategy. You have to kind of pick your strategy. What kind of units are you going to be summoning? Um, and once you summon these units, they don't start out immediately in combat. You kind of have to walk them to the battlefield. Mm -hmm. And every turn you're also getting cards that are kind of single-use cards that can either be used on your turn or at instant speed, kind of on anyone's turn. And those cards will have one-off effects that can completely change the scope of the game. True. Um, a lot of the combat here involves either setting yourself up for some card advantage or you know, pumping your units with combat tricks. Um, that's why it is sort of adjacent to Magic the Gathering combat. Yep. Um, the game also has a few other aspects, which... Uh, <laughs> I see what you did there. Yeah. Um, the... the um, one one of the cards that you can play is called um, Selector, um, you know, Create Aspects. Oh, it was um, Equip Aspects. Um, there's um, like a rotating list of cards that serve as player modifiers. Um, think of them kind of like, you know, emblems in MTG with an ability that kind of is uh, static that happens, you know, on your turn but is unique to you. Yep. Those can be traded around um, throughout the game, and uh, though we didn't get a chance to play with them, there are some very special units that you can summon under very special circumstances that act almost like you know special heroes or champions on the battlefield. Um, so those are all really cool aspects of the game, and also different kinds of units um, that the game has to offer besides your basic three. Uh, my favorite part of Life Siphon is actually... Uh, a sort of a quick story about their Kickstarter campaign. There's penguins in this game. There's not supposed to be, but there are. And it's because they did their Kickstarter to fund Life Siphon across the months of March and April, which means that April 1st was, uh, was in that time frame. They joked around saying that they were going to put penguins in the game. And then the community said, what if that wasn't a joke? And we, we paid you to actually put penguins in this game. Mm -hmm. And so they said, okay, well, like, it's going to be a stupid stretch goal. And the community said, ha, 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 fuck you. Penguins are in the game now. So penguin, I like penguin that. Penguin game pieces. <laughs> there's siphon actual now. penguin game pieces in Life Siphon. They, they officially serve no function in the game. They're just, they're, they're in the box. Ready for you to enjoy. They are 100% in the box. I had questions about what to do with the penguin, and they said, don't worry about it. They're just Penguins there. Are... They're just and, there. And after uh, we played Life Siphon, uh, we also got to play test a, a new game that's coming out in the future, and I think people will be stoked about it. And me, as a penguin aficionado, very stoked about it. This this game that's was... Tease. <laughs> this game was so like in development we played it on paper slips baby <laughs> yep we play tested it it was an actual factual play test <clears throat> yeah. after you left i actually we modified the rules and played it again to try and account for uh the issues that came up we in talked about play test it was a real play test mm -hmm. we... and you know i i don't i don't think i want to go into too much detail about this game no. here uh just because it doesn't quite seem like the place but I just love the way Lay Waste designs games and takes community feedback. Um, I can tell that there's – these guys aren't just a couple amateurs that said they wanted to make a game. Like the team, They've been doing it now for years. Yeah, they, they have definitely been doing this for, for a long time. I, I can see their mind working through the problems that other people wouldn't think about. Um, and it's just – it's it's so cool to watch this company develop board games because I think they're doing stuff that's just different. I don't see games like the lay waste games people make. Yeah, and I – it's so great because, like, they've been supporting the Community Endurance Run for years, and it's so great that they're – I legitimately enjoy every single one of their games. I don't even need to feel, like, weird or guilty about, hey, they're supporting us. We should really say nice things. No, I want to say nice things because I love all their games. I've played all of them. I own all of them except for Human Era because <clears throat> Human Era, I 
tend to not have enough people in a room to play mm-hmm. a uh, hidden information game like that. But I will be buying Life Scythe, and I didn't have enough room in my backpack to pick it up. Mm-hmm. But um, it, it's nice. Like, they've supported uh, our event, and also we really enjoy their games. Yeah, they're just cool people all around. There was um, – jumping to a new game, there was one that uh, – it was – I would describe it as an unassuming game that really caught my attention, and I will probably be using this – in some sort of educational capacity at my business with my math students. Cool. Um, the game was called Cristallo. That's a cool name. It is a cool name, and it had cool pieces and cool um, cool gameplay. So, so Cristallo uses similar rules to uh, an older card game called Set. If anybody's ever played the card game Set, they'll realize that, or they will remember that, you're looking to make groups of three that either are all the same in some um, uh, in some characteristic or all different in some characteristic. Um, and so the actual game set has something like, I don't know, there's like dozens of different combinations of how to make a set because there's four different categories of characteristics. In this game, they brought it down to just um, two different characteristics, uh, essentially crystals that have either a number assignment or a color assignment. And you've got to match them so that they are either all the same color with all the same number, all same color, all different number, all different colors, all different numbers, and all different colors, all same numbers. Those are the only four ways you can make a set. Anyway, getting too much into the details here. What's neat about this game is that they added a cool like kind of fantasy story element to it. They line up these six cards that have an image of these like cool creatures from from mythology, like um, like an ice wolf, a fairy, like a phoenix, a, a fire fox, all kinds of cool elemental based creatures. And as you create sets around these um, orbs, you unlock and free them. These creatures have been trapped by an evil black dragon. Not and again. No. And so as you're laying down these uh, cards, you're slowly but surely freeing all of these creatures by setting these beautifully um, carved crystal pieces on the cards themselves. Once you free them all, you get an opportunity to um, to go after the black dragon by doing like a phase two of the game where you play a shorter, smaller version. Here's some of the characteristics that really stood out to me about this particular board game. Um, so you sort of like kill the first nine cards in the game. You just like deal them out into a separate pile and you don't, and you don't get to play with those. You play the game without them until phase two. This makes sure that each game is a little bit different. You shuffle up and then you play minus nine cards. So there's a good um, variety. Every game's a little bit different there. Once you go to phase two, you take all the cards that you've used to free the uh, to free the creatures. They're all expended now. If you have any cards left, great. You add those to the nine cards that you put off to the side. That's your only resource to defeat the black dragon. In phase one of this game, you have to just draw a card and play it immediately. So the order is kind of determined. In phase two, you can lay out all the cards in front of you and mix and match them and redo it if you want to um, because you have far fewer resources to work with. I'm thinking about this from a very like growth mindset game, pattern recognition game. It's fun. It's colorful. I'm honestly going to start playing this with my with my kids at work. But when I talk to the relative of the person who made the game, she was there as kind of an ambassador. Her name was uh, Emma. Um, she was the like ambassador for the board game that day. I got really into the game and started asking questions about how certain rules interacted. And in some cases, they didn't actually have a well-defined answer for it, which is okay because I think it left the game open-ended. And you can sort of modify the rules based on how you want the game to be played. And the game itself is not designed to be adversarial. It could be played as a one-player game. You can just play it by yourself as a one-player game. You could play it with friends if you wanted to by having people have maybe small hand sizes and you take turns. You could play it adversarially if you have two copies of the game and they have their own um, 
you know, creatures to free. And then perhaps like you're battling each other as the opposing black dragon. Like this game has a lot of potential. And I was talking with the developer, or I should say the niece of the woman who made it. Um, and she's like, wow, this sounds like, like we didn't realize how much potential this game could have if we just wrote another page in the rule book. Cool. And I mean, I don't want to talk about a, a game's rules that don't exist, but the fact that the game itself, just as it is in the in the rule book, functions well, but simultaneously leaves so much modification and house ruling that could add multiple layers to this game. I'm really excited to play this with kids and play this at a table with other grown-ups. Great. So that sounds great. This sounds like a good teaching tool. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So did you have any panels that you want to shout out? Because I, I went to Pat Bear's anime panel. I went to the uh, Improvised Postmortem and Let's Rank It. But I didn't do too many panels this year. Uh, okay, yeah. So I had um, a couple panels that I went to, but I'm really only going to talk about one in particular. Um, I I love the panels at PAX. Um, that's one of my favorite aspects of this whole event because I can talk to the people that make the games that I like or, or, or talk to people that are experts in their field that have such um, expertise. Like, yeah, expertise and insight on the game's community or, you know, the art or the music or, or, or what have you. And this year I chose to go to a few less panels than I have in years past. But the one that really jumped out to me were the education panels that I went to. There were three panels that I saw that all had education aspects. One was called Beyond Hit Points, um, Healthy Behaviors in and Around Games that talked about like how um, specifically like, you know, like students or or, you know, people, even even adults can um can make sure that they're playing games in a healthy way or like looking out for behaviors and how people play games. The, the, the other one was called uh, the player is evolving using games to foster a growth mindset. And the third was called uh, Hey, listen games teaching with video games. That's the one that I really want to talk about here is the Hey, listen games panel. Um, there are um, members of this panel that are minors. And so I won't call out their names. Mm -hmm. But it was a teacher, a high school teacher from a school in New York City that brought some some of his own students to pack like a chaperoned field trip because this teacher um, has lesson plans that directly incorporate playing video games to teach specific topics. So you've immediately caught my attention, right? Lesson plans with video games. I'm in. What's interesting about this particular school is that it has a high concentration of immigrant students, mm -hmm. many of which are English language learners. And so they would play games like um, – what's the Edith Finch game? Uh, the something of – of, like the something of Edith Finch. I forget what it's called. But like um, they would play that game. They would play uh, Gone Home to like learn like um, – like literary analysis. I think Gone Home has like tons and tons of text in it, right? Like there's yeah, a, a bunch of like um, like newspapers and journals and stuff that you can pick up. Yep. Well, for these English language learners, that was kind of tough, but it was part of their class assignment to like explore the narrative of, of Gone Home. Um, they would play Celeste in their um, like advisory class to talk about growth mindset and like handling failure, handling stress. I just loved everything that this was talking about, and uh, I was then directed to a website called Hey Listen Games, mm -hmm. where this guy publishes and posts for free lesson plans that anybody could take and adapt that involve some form of video game as part of their lesson plan. Yep. Excellent. So just a free resource for teachers that want to try this out of incorporating a video game into the lesson plan. The, 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 like the young guys that were up there on the panel were speaking about how the game, them, how, how the game in the classroom changed their perspective on going to school. Like these are a bunch of like high school juniors and seniors saying, yeah, this worked. 
Like it made me more engaged. I'm a lazy student. I don't like to do work. This made me do work and I felt like I'm better for it. So that was really cool. Um, the last thing that I'll say about this is the Hey Listen Games currently has zero math curriculums that involve video games. So I'm over here like cracking my knuckles and stretching out, ready to design some lesson plans once I am finished with my grad school program and I'm officially certified to create lesson plans. Excellent. That's super cool. Yeah, dude. Got some got some lesson plan help then. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I did get to speak with the teacher themselves, and I said, you know, hey, I'm Billy. I'm in a master's program. I'm trying to be a math teacher. I probably can't help you for like two years, but if I have an opportunity, I would love to help co-design some lesson plans that would involve math and video games because this person was sort of a English lit history advisor teacher and didn't really touch the STEM that much. Mm -hmm. um, not that, you know, this person couldn't, I guess, if they tried, oh, but yeah, of course, but I am you about know, to become an expert in that field specifically. I mean, I would just more hands. Myself. Yeah. M more hands. All already. Always I got better. the math stuff covered. Excellent. How about you? Uh, I saw panels that streamed out. You should check out, you know, Pat Bear's anime panel was pretty good. Um, the improvised postmortem was funny as always. Let's rank. It was funny as always. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, which one did they do this year? The, the Let's Rank It? What sorts of things did they rank? Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. Someone four years ago wanted them to rank Turn on the Fog Machine, which was a reference to a League of Heels tragedy that uh -huh. didn't go well. Uh -huh, and uh -huh. they came back this year and said they would like them to re-rank Turn on the Fog Machine. So instead, they ranked the hubris of someone to come back four years after their shitty idea was ranked lowly the first time to appeal the ruling. Um, it ranked one uh, point lower than his original joke. And after being ranked that, he said, uh, I'll see you in four years, which I've never felt so threatened. All right. <laughs> um, that was pretty good. Uh, there was someone who... Uh, man, there were some rankings that just made no sense. Just like people had bits. Someone played a song. Like it was called like truck music or something. It was a beat made out of like car sirens and honking. Sounds good. And and the beat was really bad and didn't go anywhere. Like at first everyone was bopping to it, and then there was no drop. It just kept going, and so they ranked it very poorly. Mm. Um. There were there were a few good ranks. Uh, nothing. The thing that ranked the highest was someone came up and said, um, "Well, no. I mean, there there were a bunch of like good. Ra I would I would like I would recommend someone check out the panel. I think it was recorded. Um, and if if it wasn't, check out the Let's Rank It panel. It's always a good time. Um, all right. I think that's all I've got on Pax East." Uh -huh. It was a good show. I'm, I'm learning. I'm not trying to get there at 8 in the morning. I'm mm -hmm. not trying to get in the queue line. Yeah, fuck showing that. Showing up at like 1030, getting in. There's like no lines at that point. And then I'm having a fine time mm -hmm. because the mm -hmm. indie games are what matter. There was just one last thing that I wanted to hit on, and it didn't fall into the category of panels or tabletop or video games, but music. I had the opportunity, oh, yeah. the amazing opportunity – to watch the Supergiant Games concert perform. It was hands down the highlight of my packs this year. I am a big fan of Supergiant Games, as are you, I'm sure. Um, but we got to see, um, uh, I believe the gentleman's name was Austin Wintery as the conductor of the Supergiant. Austin Wintery? Yeah, mm-hmm. Of uh, so that they were of journey composition flame, uh, fame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, was um, uh, was the conductor for the um, the su the soup the super giant games or orchestra, um, Darren Corb and Ashley Barrett, who are the. Uh, Darren Korb is the one who did all the sound design for Supergiant Games, and Ashley Barrett obviously is the female vocals for characters like um, um, 
Zia in Bastion and Red in Transistor and so forth. And it was just amazing to watch those people perform live. Uh, the very last song that they did, um, they, they, they did music from Pyre, from Hades, from Transistor, and they actually didn't do any Bastion music until the very, very last song. Um, and the last song they said, hey, you know what? Like, if you know the words, we'd love it if you guys sang along with us. And hearing a thousand people sing Build That Wall and – uh, like setting sail, coming home, like whatever that one is called, I believe. Um, Zolf's theme. Hearing a thousand people like hum along with Ashley Barrett, and um, uh, and God, I just lost his name. Darren Corb uh, was amazing. I mean, I had a tear in my eye. It was it was wonderful. Uh, but yes, Austin Wintry is the person who did the uh, the music for Flow and Journey. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yep. I, he's the composer for those. I think he won a, a I mean, nominated Grammy. Yep. Nominated Grammy for uh, for for Journey for best score. So that that was honestly like the best um, experience. S- probably the worst the worst experience was right afterwards but i'm not going to dog on super giant games too hard but it's honestly like a benefit and a curse because they said hey guys we're going to like sign some posters and stuff um there'll be like some merch out like out of the theater if anybody wants to stop by that's cool and all except they didn't anticipate the entire auditorium going to line up to get posters and merch signed like, I think that they thought people would kind of, like, dip out because it was getting kind of late. Maybe some of the true, like, hardcore fans would stick around. But no, like, every single person got in line when we were there for three hours. Um, at the end, they said, hey, um, we have to cut the line because the building is closing. And just, like, everyone has to leave, including the people <laughs> selling the merch. That made some people kind of upset because they felt like they weren't really given an opportunity. Um, and it was partly because they just didn't expect the mass of people to come out. So a lot of time was wasted just like getting people in an, uh, in an efficient line. Now, this was resolved because the folks over at Supergiant saw that this was kind of a goof. Like, oh, man, like we weren't prepared for this. And anybody who was sort of turned away without getting an opportunity to see them was given a copy of the PAX exclusive poster that they wouldn't have been able to get elsewhere. Um, That was really cool. And I feel like that was them recognizing like, hey, we love that you guys love us, but oh, man, we didn't expect this. And now we're just doing our best to make everybody happy and feel good. Later, we had another brief opportunity to get posters signed And I was there the second day. I did get my poster signed. And uh, as far as I know, everybody who went there the day two to get their poster signed got their stuff signed. So it was all happy ending for everybody. It just took like two days and like six hours of waiting. But the fans got what they wanted. Um, And my poster is currently being FedExed to myself from PAX so that I get yet another uh, autographed super giant games poster added to my wall. And so that sort of cherry on top was like the best PAX experience for me. That concert just floored me. I don't think I'm ever going to have as cool of a connection to a video game franchise as that moment in the super giant concert. That's awesome. Well, Glad. Hopefully they'll do that again because that that was a cool event. I couldn't stay long enough to to watch it, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but it looked super good. I will say, uh, it is official, as made official by the lovely Ashley Barrett, that as far as them doing these kind of games con shows, um, the title of best sing along was held by London, and Ashley Barrett made it official. Uh, and if anyone's contesting it, I took recorded video evidence of that. Maybe I shouldn't have, but I, I, I do. Of her saying, you have officially surpassed London in best sing-along. So PAX East Boston 2020 is, to date, the best audience sing-along they've had. Excellent. 
Well, I think that's it for PAX East then. Uh, that's it for me. Yeah, I don't have anything else. Um, I don't have anything else. So this has been another PAX report. Uh, reminder, if you want to get in touch with the show, you can do so at Deep Listens Pod on Twitter, deeplistens.libson.com. We've got our comment sections and deeplistenspodcast at gmail.com. You can also support the show on patreon.com slash deeplistens. Thank you, Billy. Great to have you back. Thanks, for everybody, another... for tuning in. Yep. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and get back to um, working out, eating healthy, killing it at my job, and uh, being a full-time grad student at the same time. I'm going to get back to playing video games and talking into this microphone. So thank you, listeners. Till next time, peace.